the open floor. The Senator from Indiana. Mr. President, I rise this evening to honor a longtime friend, the confidant and mentor, Chuck Colson, whose life we will celebrate tomorrow at a memorial service at the National Cathedral. It's been said that a man's character can be tested by the way he responds to adversity. If that is the case, Chuck Colson's character was one of remarkable strength tenacity, faith, and humility. Chuck was a brilliant man with a resume of impressive accomplishments at a very young age. A scholarship to an Ivy League school, a law degree from George Washington University, a veteran and at one time the youngest captain in the Marine Corps, a former chief of staff to a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, and then top assistant and legal counsel to the President of the United States. Now this doesn't sound like the type of man that, we would, that would find himself sitting alone in a federal prison cell, but that's exactly what happened to Chuck Colson, and what happened there changed his life forever. Known as President Nixon's hatchet man, Colson pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice in the Daniel Ellsberg case during the Watergate scandal and went from White House Special Counsel to incarcerated felon. In 1974, Colson entered Maxwell Federal Prison Camp in Alabama. This fall, from perhaps the closest confidant of the President of the United States to a federal prison cell is about as far and as deep as anyone could fall. That's what we call hitting rock bottom. But rock bottom for Chuck Colson became a time of repentance, a time of grace, and a time of transformation. Far from the Rose Garden, it was behind those prison bars where Chuck Colson made one of the most important decisions of his life, one that would impact the lives of thousands. He decided to dedicate the rest of his life serving the God that he loved. The scripture in Proverbs reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. With a redemption, redemption that all, can only come through the grace of God, and with a renewed sense of vision, Chuck did just that. He put his trust in the Lord and submitted to him, and he decided to let God write the story of his life rather than try to control his own destiny. That transformation is the story that we will celebrate tomorrow at the National Cathedral. A story of redemption and a testament to the power of God's forgiveness and love. Chuck Colson's experience in prison and his renewed sense of vision opened his eyes to a sector of our society that is often forgotten. Once a prisoner himself, and having experienced the depth of his own need for repentance and transformation, even those at the very bottom of society, Chuck believed that God could change them and any willing heart. As described in the first two of his many published books, the first one, Born Again, and the second, Life Sentence, Chuck dedicated his now transformed life to serving prison inmates in the families of prisoners. In 1976, he practiced what he preached and founded Prison Fellowship, a Christian ministry to give prisoners the opportunity to experience the radically transforming power of Christ that he had experienced himself. Chuck Colson's ministry took him to visit 600 prisons in the United States and in 40 other countries. He worked relentlessly to improve prison conditions, increase access to religious programs, and to provide resources and support to the families of prisoners. Prison ministry was not his only passion. In his later years, Chuck focused his efforts on developing other Christian leaders who could influence their communities through their faith. This became the cornerstone of the Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview, a research and training center established to promote Christian worldview teaching. Chuck has touched many lives of many people, 
through his ministry, books, lectures, and charity work. And I am one of those who is personally grateful for the positive influence he has had on my life. It was in April of 1976 that I was, uh, that I attended a, a annual Fort Wayne, Indiana Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. I was intrigued uh, with the speaker who was announced as Chuck Colson, recently released from prison, uh, formerly Watergate figure and legal counsel to the president. As I sat through uh, his presentation, uh, I was touched in a way and reached in a way that uh, transformed my life. And I am ever grateful to Chuck Colson uh, for using himself as I think a conduit of a message that I also needed to receive. Uh, it resulted in a radical change, of course, for me. From a predictable, settled, purposeful, I thought, life uh, as an attorney in a mid-sized firm in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to becoming engaged in politics, something I never thought I would engage in. It was Chuck Colson that made me ask that same question and make that same decision that he made. And that is to no longer try to control the direction of my life, uh, but subject myself to the control of someone who had a plan for me. And that plan was not a specific serving in the Senate or Congress. It was simply uh, to be open uh, to the possibility of a, pa a path that perhaps uh, I had not ever thought would be taken. Uh, as a consequence of that and as a consequence of a string of events that is uh, impossible for me to claim any credit for, I find myself standing here in the United States Senate delivering this tribute to Chuck Colson. Marsha and I will miss him greatly. and We will continue to be motivated and inspired by the example of how life should be lived. When I first came to the Senate, I was here just two days, and I received a call from Chuck Colson. He said, I have a gift for you, and it's a precious gift, and one I don't want to give, but I think this gift can be more useful as someone who can speak as a United States Senator than someone like me who can speak as head of prison fellowship. That gift was a young man by the name of Michael Gerson, who had, after leaving college, uh, worked for Prison Fellowship and helped uh, both through policy uh, uh, decisions and through uh, the written word, helped Chuck with his ministry. And this young man worked for me for a number of years and uh, was, uh, I was the voice of his thinking and the voice of his written messages. He went on to become a speechwriter for an, a presidential candidate and then a chief speechwriter for uh, President uh, George W. Bush. Michael Gerson wrote a piece that was published in the Washington Post on April 22nd, titled Charles Colson Found Freedom in Prison. That piece, I think, is, is worth certainly in reading, and Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent that it be inserted in the record immediately following my speech. Without objection. Chuck said, or excuse me, uh, Mike Gerson said in his column, Chuck led a movement of volunteers attempting to love some of their least lovable neighbors. This inversion of social policies and priorities, putting the last first, is the best evidence of a faith that is more than crutch, opiate, or a self-help program. It is the hallmark of authentic religion, and it is the vast, humane, contribution of Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson's remarkable life story can serve as a guiding light and provide all of us the courage and the strength to overcome whatever adversity we may face in our own lives. May we remember the example of Chuck Colson and in the words prayed so often, <clears throat> by my very dear friend, Please show me how you want me to live and give me the power to live that way. Mr. President, I yield the floor.
and uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hickok.
Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you know, it's very hard to believe that today marks exactly two months since I first came to the floor to advocate passage on the Senate's version of the Violence Against Women Act. I was very encouraged to see our body finally come together and eventually support this important legislation. The Violence Against Women Act has helped provide life-saving assistance to hundreds of thousands of women and their families, and it certainly was a no-brainer to make sure all women had access to that assistance. However, I was very disappointed to learn that a day after we passed it, the House Republicans pulled an immediate U-turn and introduced their version of the bill that would undo the common sense progress that we'd made. Mr. President, the House Republican version of VAWA is a giant step backward for victims of domestic violence. It is dangerous and irresponsible and leaves women across the country more vulnerable to domestic abuse. Not only do they remove important protections that would be created by the Senate version of the bill, they actually stripped existing protections already provided by this important law. In fact, it removed critical protections for LGBT victims. It does very little to address the epidemic of domestic and sexual violence in our tribal communities. It removed critical protections already in place for students on college campuses, and it rolled back protections for immigrant victims. Mr. President, we've made a lot of progress since VAWA was first passed back in 1994, and I hope no one will insist on putting par partisan politics ahead of protecting victims of domestic violence. Where a person lives, who they love, what their citizenship status may be, should not determine whether or not their perpetrators are brought to justice. The Senate bill that we passed last month builds on what works in the current law. It improved what didn't. It continues on the path of reducing violence towards women. And it should not be controversial. Mr. President, it's time for the House Republicans to come to their senses, support our bipartisan bill, so that women and families in this country can get the resources and support that they need. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The majority leader is recognized. I ask unanimous consent. I call Corn be terminated. Without objection. I now ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to pre-morning morning business. Senators allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. I now ask that we proceed to SRS 460. The clerk will report. Senate Resolution 460 designating the week of May 20th through May 26, 2012 as National Public Works Week. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid on the table. There be no intervening action or debate. May statements be placed in the record as if read. Without objection. I ask unanimous, and I would say that before we leave this uh, matter, Mr. President, Senator Anhoff, Senator Boxer, the chair and ranking member of that most important committee, Environment and Public Works. This is National Public Works Week. And this is good because during the, this week, we're doing our utmost on a bipartisan basis to complete the conference with the House to get the highway bill passed, 2.8 million jobs. So that would be a big celebration for National Public Works Week if we could get that bill done. And I appreciate very much Boxer and Inhofe working so closely together on that committee. I ask consent that now we now proceed to SRES 461. The clerk will report. Senate Resolution 461, recognizing the teachers of the United States for their contributions to the development and progress of our nation. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. Mr. President, I ask consent that we, this resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion reconsidered laid on the table, there be no intervening action or debate, and any statements relating to this matter appear in the record at the appropriate place as if given. Without objection. Mr. President, yes, 3187, 
was introduced earlier today by Senators Harkin and Enzi, and I ask for its first reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the first time. S-3187, a bill to amend the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and so forth, and for other purposes. I now ask for its second reading, but object to my own request. Objection heard. The, the measure will be read for the second time on the next legislative day. Mr. President, very important piece of legislation done in the right way. Senators Harkin and Enzi have done something the way we always used to do things. They moved a bill out of committee to the Senate floor. Truly a bipartisan bill, so important to our country. The FDA bill, Food and Drug Administration. And Senator Enzi has always been very, very focused on when we bring something to the floor, it must have a committee uh, mark on it. And this bill does. Now, Mr. President, the reason I move to the bill today the way I have is to line this up for filing cloture on Thursday. I hope we don't have to file cloture on this. To proceed to it, why don't we get on the bill? We could get on the bill, we could start on it Monday. We could start offering amendments and get this thing moving along. I've talked to Senator Enzi, I've talked to Senator Harkin. We had really good luck on the highway bill. We had good luck also on the postal bill. We had relevant amendments. This is a very important piece of legislation. I hope we can move to this without having to file cloture. If I have to file cloture, I'll have to file cloture, but I sure hope not. And I really admire the cooperation and the working together of Senators Harkin and Enzi. <coughs> Mr. President, I now ask consent that when the Senate completes its business today, Senate adjourn until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, May 16th, following the prayer and the pledge during the proceedings to be approved to date, morning hour be deemed expired, the time for two leaders be reserved for use later in the day. I now... Yes. Without objection. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. President, following leader remarks, tomorrow morning the Senate will begin debate on several motions to proceed to Senate uh, to resolutions introduced by Republican senators. This is an agreed upon method of proceeding on these resolutions. It's my intention to equally divide the first hour with, with majority controlling the first 30 minutes, Republicans co controlling the second 30 minutes. So I would ask consent that be the case. Without objection. So we, uh, there's six hours of debate time allowed under the consent agreement that was approved earlier today. I certainly hope that we can uh, get this done expeditiously. Uh, we'll have Senator Conrad will be leading the leading efforts on our side opposed to this. And um, once we get this out of the way, um, we should move forward. Ms. President, after um, tomorrow morning, after we understand that morning hour will be deemed expired and time for two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day, I ask unanimous consent that I be recognized at that time. Without objection. There's no further business coming before the Senate. I ask that adjourn in the previous order. Senate stands adjourned until 9.30, Wednesday, May 16th. Thank you. The Senate is finished up for the day. Today, Senators extended the charter of the Export-Import Bank in a 78-20 to 20 vote. The bank was established.